There's fishing, boating, cycling, walking and a whole lot more. Waterways Ireland, over 1,000 kilometres of unexplored outdoors. Discover what you can do at waterwaysireland.org. The government wants fully remote and blended working to become a much bigger part of Irish life. If you're an employer, now is the time to speak to staff and decide what works best for your business. If you're an employee, your employer might be talking to you about how to maintain your current working arrangement or about reaching a new one. To help you make these decisions, the government has developed guidance around remote working and created a nationwide infrastructure of remote working hubs. For more information on how to make remote work, visit gov.ie forward slash remote. The Future Proof Podcast. In 2011, six so-called astronauts from the European Space Agency left a car park from Moscow where they had pretended to be on Mars for over 500 days, the science of which is only now being published. What could we possibly learn from an experiment like this? Find out on Future Proof. The Future Proof Podcast. Proudly supported by Science Foundation Ireland. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now at Newstalk.com or on the Newstalk app, powered by Go Loud. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Now then, you're welcome, Max. So the hurling over the weekend, really the headline news, Limerick 229, Tipperary 321, a three in a row in Munster for Tipperary, the first side since, uh, or for Limerick, excuse me, the first side since Tipperary in 1989 to do the three in a row. So Limerick 229, tip 321. In Leinster, we had the Leinster final at Croke Park on Saturday evening. Some things never change. A win for Cody and Kilkenny against Dublin. 125 to 19 points. Dublin hit by a COVID outbreak in advance of the game. They lost four players ahead of the game. The qualifiers then, we had Clare beating Wexford 225 to 222. A three-point win in Thurless. Clare raced into huge lead. Uh, Wexford asleep for the first quarter and then pegged their way back but left themselves with too much to do. Waterford beat Leash as well and if you haven't heard, the draw has been made for round two of the qualifiers will have Clare against Cork in Limerick and we will have Galway against Waterford in Thurless both those games on Saturday but we have to start with the game between Limerick and Tipperary as we were discussing on the news round tip into a 10 point lead at half time and then what followed one of the more devastating third quarters wherever you're likely to see in the game of hurling despite being down by 10 points at half time by the 53rd minute the game was pretty much done in Limerick's favour when Kyle Hayes did this Kyle Hayes beaten one steps past the second bounces the ball he's gone he's still going he's Kyle Hayes going. Kyle Hayes 14 Kyle Hayes the one more Kyle. he's turned yeah. the best goal you'll ever see 222 to 217 you will not see a better goal from Kyle Hayes incredible skill he bounced it three or four times and rattled the back of the net Limerick in front by five Oh, that was unbelievable. He started on his own 65. That was an unbelievable goal, Dan. He ran the whole way. His gears were there. And do you know what? Consider the week that was in it and the day that was in it. It's only fit right that that man has gone up and stuck the ball in the back of the net. Unbelievable. Yeah, amazing commentary in Live 95. Shane Dowling there alongside Donna Sullivan. The week Kyle Hayes had, obviously, if you hadn't heard, one of his friends uh, passed away tragically during the week. So it's been a difficult week there, I'm sure, for him. But the goal was outrageous. Eddie Brennan is with us. Hey, Eddie. Good evening, Joe. How's the farm? That goal. Talk to us about just yeah. how good it was. I mean, the amount of different elements which went into it for a start. <laughs> well, I suppose I'll, I'll, uh, we, we won't, uh, I won't uh, take away the compliments. I'll hold the compliments for a minute. But uh, I, I suppose we, we talked a few weeks ago about the art of defending. And uh, <laughs> I think if you were to look back on it and say that a guy was going to come from his own 45 or 65 yard line, and nobody was going to lay a glove on him, you'd be kind of pulling your, your defensive unit aside in your review and saying, guys, how did this happen? But uh, I just know it as well, watching the match from the high behind, how Gillan again makes those runs. And he just literally ran straight at uh, Kyle Hayes. And in doing so, he brought Parigmar with him. And Parigmar, you know, bought it really, I suppose. His, his brief was to stick with Gillan and Markham. And as, as in doing that... I suppose he just for that split second probably then realised, oh, oh, I, I, you know, I, I, my, my priority is to protect the goal, and it's something the Tipperary were very good at. You know, I seen in the past where they would they would flood that area, but uh, you know we have to give Kyle Hayes some credit, and uh, what a, what a, what an amazing finish even because he had the hurl turned the other way down with the heel of the hurl up to the sky, which is normally you have your toe up uh, when you're striking a ball like that. 
And again, he got ferocious power in it, but I mean, he was coming at such pace. All he was doing really was going to pass that ball into the net. And I think in fairness, Barry Hogan had no hope with it, but um, I uh, I wouldn't like to have been chasing him. I think if, <laughs> if, if, if as a forward, you go, oh God, you can't believe that a back scorched you from well outside midfield and went all the way and stuck it to the net. It was just really was, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a powerhouse. We've talked a lot about Limerick over the last uh, number of years, obviously, on the show. And quite often of late, we use the phrase about Limerick, they have a higher ceiling than everybody else when we're trying to look ahead to the championship or the weeks ahead that Limerick have a higher ceiling. Often they don't hit that ceiling or they don't need to hit that ceiling. It does seem in that third quarter like they not quite peaked, but showed everybody exactly what they can do when everything's in perfect working order and when they're of a mindset to do it. Like Liam Sheedy came out and just said they annihilated us. That was the word he used. He said, look, they're true champions in that third quarter. They annihilated us. And John Kiley said in that third quarter, that's the best this team has played in my five years. And Jackie Tyrrell, even in the Sunday game last night, said that was the greatest half of hurling that he has ever seen from a team. So we're talking about something unbelievably special here, it would seem. How highly do you rate it? Yeah, it's up there. It, it, it really is. And I think I, I think even you, you can kind of say, look, they, they finished it out. And I was sitting watching the match and I thought, right, this looks like it's tips to to kind of lose now that tip, if tip, you know, keep chipping on the scores or they can maybe break momentums when, when Limerick hit that purple patch, maybe they might weather it. And, and I felt myself, you know, God, if Limerick pulled this off, it'll be unbelievable. But I felt they might get it to maybe a point or two coming down the 35th minute or something like that. I thought if they pulled the draw, I think John Kiley would have took it at that stage. But it was more the devastating 18 minutes that they put in. I think that's that for me is, is, is the bigger story. I think, yeah, once they got their confidence up and their tails were up and they were going at Tipperary, um, I think, you know, the, the rest kind of was nearly the ice and they, they would have expected once they got level that they were going to kick on. But it was the fact that they turned around such a big deficit in such a short period of time. And I suppose even for Liam Sheedy, and it's very easy for us to sit here now and, and look at it and say, you know, how can their system fall down so much in 18 minutes? It's very easy to say, well, someone should go down and break the momentum. You know, it's very easy to say that now. I mean, tip were flying they were hurling out of their skin so he's probably saying to them at half time let's have more of that please lads let's finish this match off and uh you'd say maybe i have to say look the, the galan being still on the pitch is possibly a game changer mm. you know if he doesn't stay on the pitch does that change the dynamic of that match completely i think it does um limerick are always going to come at them but uh no i think i think i'd have to give 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 praise for what happened i think as, as a period of time, I think I'm more more impressed with the short period of time at which they just devoured that lead. And then after that, you just felt, look, Tip can't seem to stem the tide here. They're just going to kick on. Um, and they done it with, with, with they, just, they just accelerated. They went from second gear. They were absolutely septic in the first half. And they just kicked into gear. I think they really dropped back a little bit deeper. I think Tipperary had a little bit of a malfunction on, the, on their own puck outs. They went short a few times. And, and again, this this is something that this Limerick full forward and, and forward division really go after and hunt down. But significantly, Keane Lynch dropped very, very deep. And I think he must have passed out about six or seven balls to Kyle Hayes. The Galan red card, and most people do think it should have been a red card, that happened when Tip were still eight points up. So definitely that was a, a factor for sure. But the bigger point, when Limerick are in that kind of form, even if they manage that for you know, only 15, 20 minutes in most games. No other team in the country can live with them when they're like that, I presume. There's a fairly healthy gap now. Yeah, I do. I I, I just was jotting down a few bits before I come on there and, and just, I, I'm, I'm looking at all the superlatives that you could use to describe it. And again, we're not overreacting here. We've seen some some pretty good comebacks over the years. You know, you take, go back even as far as 94 when Offaly turned over, uh, you know, Limerick. The word I use is frightening. I think it's frightening at, at, at the pace, the power and the skill level and the manner in which they just, you know, we talk in different, you know, the All Blacks have that, you know, at, at a time there a couple of years ago, they had that capability where they would just accelerate over a short period of time and they would blow the opposition out. Um, they, they just seem to have, you know, you talk about these good golfers as well, that they just dismantle a, a course. And Limerick just absolutely dismantled Tipperary just after halftime. And I don't think any of us, nobody saw that coming. 
Um, people say, geez, I wonder what was said at halftime. I would imagine it was pretty calm in that Limerick dressing room at halftime. I think, I think the, the message has to be, right, lads, wipe out the first half. We can't change that. But let's win the first ball. Let's win that ball. Everybody to a man, win the first ball, get a turnover, get something happening, and we'll see where it takes us from there. And little by little, I think once they got, you know, maybe that first score straight away and that was it, they, they just clicked into gear and, and uh, you'd say just Tipperary just were not able to, to break that momentum at all. Yeah. So look, you've been part of teams that kind of hit these great heights and I, I can only imagine how amazing it must feel to be in perfect sync with each other and to, you know, feel devastating or frightening to use your word and you could kind of see that in the full-time scenes I mean three in a row so first time since Tip in 89 which is a big achievement no Limerick side has won three in a row in Munster since the 30s but there was like a jubilation about that Limerick team I think not just because of the Munster win but almost a recognition as John Kiley put it that's the best we've played in his five years there was almost a sense looking at them of whoa that was unbelievable and even like they knew looking at each other like holy hell that was awesome yeah, and I think you, you, you got a sense of, of the the battle they were in by even Seamus Flanagan's reaction. You know, even they, they were really pumped up and they were just feeding off each other, you know, when they got that first goal. And I have to say, Barry Hogan made a phenomenal save because that ball was travelling when it left Galan's hurl and there was a tip man coming across in front of him. And I think some days you see, you know, I suppose they're the tin margins that if he throws the hurl at that or kind of, you know, reaches out reflex and deflects it, it flies off in a direction, such as the powers hit. But he got so much goalkeeping hurl behind it, it actually stopped it out, and it, it fell lovely for Seamus Flanagan. And and that was the, that was the, the start of it. Once that went in, but yeah, I think on the point of that, I think for that, you could see the 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 real elation in the in the Limerick players because I think they're probably learning what it's like to be the the team that everybody wants to knock. And and I'm sure at half time they were heading into that dressing room wondering was this it you know were they were they in in big big trouble and and some of them probably were and it just takes guys to step up and start executing the basics and Mm. yeah i can definitely relate to that look we unfortunately we we had a great day in the opening 20 minutes against against waterford in one year and i I remember talking to you know michael cavan about it and he said it's it was probably just the the best period of hurling he said it was just a matter of it just happened to be waterford he said but that day just everything we seemed to touch so you can kind of understand what happened there just after half time, and you can appreciate it. And, and I think you just admired for what it is. You know, it was just a phenomenal uh, 18 minutes of phenomenal spell of hurling. What do you suspect a defeat like that does now for Sheedy and for Tipperary? Does he look at it and acknowledge it was so devastating that it is time to bring some of the younger lads in? People are suggesting that that uh, has been required for some time and you use your experience off the bench or maybe he looks at it and says, well, no team in the country can live with them. I'm still sticking to my guns here. Yeah, I suppose uh, we can just speculate on that and offer our opinion. My, my own opinion this year was the dilemma that Liam Sheedy had to start this year was uh, he either sticks with his trusted lieutenants and there's a core of them there, which which all were playing on, on Saturday, who have been with him through minors and, you know, 2010, 2019, or if he starts rejuvenating fresh blood into that team and is coming off the back of an under-20 and an under-21 success. So I think if he starts flushing that through and starting a few of those guys this year, to me, that would be an indicator that Liam Sheedy is here for another few years. But my own opinion is that by going with his trusted guys, I think, I think you know, maybe Liam Sheedy is going to sit back at the end of this year. And I'm not, I'm not writing them off in any way. That's just, I suppose, my, my view of yeah. what Tipperary have to do this year. And I think... He probably needed to blood a few lads and get a few of those guys in there. But hey, he's the manager. He sees what's, what we don't see night in, night out. He knows the calibre of guys he's dealing with, so he will go with that. And I think he will stick with that now. He might have to freshen up a position or two. He might have to look at the guys that are knocking the door in the train. And I'm sure some of the guys are probably showing a bit of form. But I think at this stage, look, he gets... The, the plus side for Liam Sheedy is, you know, he acknowledged Limerick's performance and said, look, they just blew us away. He'll still look at it and say where the learnings are for them and say, look, we have two weeks now to freshen up, refocus and recalibrate the system. And I think if Limerick, if, if Tipperary were looking for motivation in the next round, well, the, the winners of Galway and Watford, what more, more motivation would he need? I think Watford took them out last year and then there's obviously, uh, you know, a rival managing, you know, Watford. So that just adds another dynamic to it. And I think... He'll have to, I suppose it's a bit of soul searching now, 
But um, I still think that if Tipperary can get, you know, freshen up, which they have two weeks to do, I still think uh, no team would like to be meeting them. Clare 225, Wexford 222. Clare got off to an incredible start. Wexford sleep first quarter, left themselves way too much to do. And Clare won uh, comfortably-ish that maybe they would feel they should have been more ahead. But I suppose that game's been overshadowed by Davy Fitzgerald after the game, talking about various things. I don't necessarily think he was asked about a lot of this stuff. He just seemed to want to get it off his chest. So first of all, the Brian Lohan uh, feud. I keep using that word feud. It's just such a media word. I don't know what to uh, describe it as the um, uh, falling out, I suppose. Here was David Fitzgerald talking about Brian Lohan. People said to me, would you ever talk to Brian Lohan again or any of this? I'll tell you straight out. Straight for the sake of clear, 110%. If someone got a meeting with me and Brian Lohan tomorrow, I'd do it. And I, I mightn't like Brian Lohan, and I mightn't have much time for him and the way he does stuff. He wouldn't have it, he'd have the same for me. But we shouldn't be at each other in clear. If clear to succeed, they all need to be together. And I'm saying it straight now. Would I put it to bed? I'd stand up in the morning and I'd go talk to anyone and I'd shake hands and I'd put it to bed 110%. I don't want Clare to be fighting with one another. I think we need to have a good hard look at ourselves in Clare and stop that. I hear the other night, the first thing they'll do is blame the county board for stuff. Easy target again. We, we need to stop that. We need to stop that. I, I see people that can get on keyboards and do stuff. Have they ever gone down the field? Have they ever worked with their clubs? Have they ever done stuff? We need to get a grip and clear so do 110%. We need to work together. So that was one. And then a second uh, short clip here. So Davy's father, Pat Fitzgerald, is secretary of the Clare County Board. The County Board been criticised at length. It's been a winter of discontent in particular, just gone. So Davy Fitzgerald addressed the abuse levelled at, I'm presuming here largely, his father. I've experienced the toughest year I've ever experienced in GA. The way myself and my family have been treated is an absolute and utter disgrace and the way I felt probably all week I didn't even know if I wanted to come into this game to tell you the truth um, and I'll put it to you like this in Clare the biggest problem we have is a small bunch of people that create problems they think they're helping and they're not and I'm going to put it to you like this very 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 simply it's I'm a simple person that loves GA I think I'm one of the most ever played for Clare GA um, my dad, who I'm extremely proud of, has done an unbelievable job. The amount of abuse and stick and criticism he has taken unwarranted is not, not justified. And can I say it to, to people? People have brothers and sisters, mams and dads. People have people that actually care about them. And what people in the media and clear have done is absolutely disgusting. What people in social media have done is disgusting. What one or two people, one or two clubs have done, instead of looking at themselves and how they can make their things better, they have tried to pull us into a place that we don't need to be. But can I say the amount, the amount of support that I've got from within 90% of Clare clubs is absolutely incredible. And it's only the few. We need to stop. So that was Davy. It was given short shrift by some. Paul Galvin, who was in as the football manager in Wexford, said David Fitz loves to play the victim when it suits him. He's far from a victim in how he behaves behind the scenes while fronting to the media. And I can personally attest to that. Hope someone in the media has the guts to ask him hard questions now. Always the victim, David, never your fault. Was uh, one response. What did you make of all this, Eddie? I, I, I can't speak to the social media abuse or what's going on in the Clare media. So I don't really know exactly what he's talking about but he's obviously upset anyway yeah look I, I think there's a number of layers to, to what he's saying there afterwards and I think look first and foremost you know I, I find it I find it a little bit strange I mean again we, we I suppose have to deal with the question in two different areas looking at the, the Clare side of it and, and, and the abuse that's going on I mean there's, there's levels of that that's unacceptable but I suppose what I find a little bit odd with that like I mean Davy Fitzgerald is the Wexford manager, and he's talking about we and Clare. Like so, I think the, I think himself he needs to maybe, you know, I suppose, you know, is he going to finish up with Wexford? Who knows? But he's talking about Clare as if he's, you know, involved in some way there. And and, and as a Clare man, I'm sure behind the scenes and and a proud Clare man at that, I'm sure he wants to see Clare succeed. But I think it's it's a it's a kind of a weird tone given that it's Wexford versus Clare and. And it's not an easy situation. I, I wouldn't like to be in a situation where you're managing, you know, your your own a different county against your own county in a knockout championship match. That's a that's a tough, tough situation to be in. But um I suppose look, the other side of it is 
th th there's a lot of layers to what's going on, you know, and has been a winter of discontent in in Clare. And again, I suppose we speculate on that and, and, and we get little little bits and pieces of what is going on down there. And I suppose um, I don't know exactly the facts and the ins and outs mm -hmm. of that. But I, I don't know. I think, I think look, Dave, is, he's a complex kind of a character. I think, I think he, he incites things and, and he also, you know, has this passionate side to him. But I certainly think, look, I think certain times, I think, you know, in that situation, it's just about nothing else, only the, clear, the, the Wexford players who he's tasked with managing. I think that's all you're saying. Look, they gave me everything today, which he did say in fairness mm. and, and park at that. And I think we're aware there's a situation in Clare, but I think, look, th there's probably a lot more to it. Again, we're, we, we, we get sniffs of both sides of the argument. And again, I'd love to be in a, in a more qualified position. But yeah. look, I, I, I suppose I, I have my, 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 my own views on Davey. He's a guy that's, that, that tickles a bit of interest. But, you know, I, I've, you know, I suppose we when you're on a pitch, you see different sides to people and, and you see different types of, of mannerisms and that. And look, that's, that's, that's the way it is that when you're on the field and it, it moves on from that. But uh, I just think on, on top of that, I think even, I think it's worth saying that I think Brian Lohan has done an unbelievable job against the backdrop of all this. Yeah. Um, against, um, you know, the whatever went on with that COVID at the time and, and different bits and pieces. I think he's had a lot to deal with. And I think what has been really impressive is that he hasn't, let his emotions and, and probably the frustrations he has felt during the winter filter into his players. He has managed to keep it separate, but equally the players are rising to, to what the support he's doing and the job he's doing and the, and, and the circumstances of which he's doing it. And, and they have a serious, serious spirit there at the moment, which makes them really dangerous. Yeah. Well, I think if someone can organise the Davy Fitz Paul Galvin round table, that would be something we'd all tune in for. There's uh, yeah. something bu bubbling I, I, away I there. I I don't see Lowen sitting down at the table. That's again my opinion. I'll I'll be surprised yeah. if, if that happens. Brian, but, uh, Brian, Brian Lohan, Davy Fitz, and Paul Galvin in conversation. That's what we need now. And I'll be the fly in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, listen, great stuff. Thanks a million. We didn't get to talk about Kilkenny. We'll do that in due course at some stage. Eddie, thanks a million. Eddie Brennan. No bother, Joe. All the best. Off the ball on News Talk. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, 